Managing Director at uh, SunWiz. And second one is uh, Carolina Nesta, Head of Asset Management Iberia at Zonedix. Um, Renuka Sharma, Managing Director of um, Biva RE APEC. And Mr. Bartosz Majewski, Co-Founder and CEO of Menlo Electric. Alfonso Martinez, Senior Investment Manager at Foresight Group. Group. Enrique, Enrique Selva Delvis, Del CEO, CEO of IM2, IM2 Energia Solar. Um, um, Polida, Polida, product, product manager, manager here at um, uh, JA, JA Solar. Solar. And, and Denisa, Denisa Pines, Secretary, Secretary General, General of the Middle East, Middle East Solar Industry Association. Association. So welcome um, to all of you panelists. panelists um, thank um, you for taking your time, your time uh, today, to, today to, to attend. To um, I, give um, I give the floor the first to Warwick. Warwick. Um, you're, but uh, unfortunately, you were muted when in, or describing a talk to uh, on. So uh, I'd like to start with uh, something of interest. I'm not sure what's of interest. Could you? Uh, we're still not hearing anything at this end, so I would love to get a prompt from you guys as to what the panel discussion should be focused on. Warwick, I think we should just go ahead. Oh, well, uh, oh, what do I begin with? There's some very interesting presentations there. It's fascinating to see the uh the level of intelligent people that have presented today on uh what is happening with renewable energy transformation globally and i'm fascinated to see work lies ahead of us um if uh, any of you are like have the experience that i have uh, hours in the day and there was not enough uh, of me um getting them all done and uh you'll see some of the projections there about um, what remains to be done and it's uh it's just it's quite impressive um i'd be interested in to hear um from each of um, the panelists here um, perhaps what's one one key thing that they uh, saw that stood out for them that they care to elaborate on uh, and perhaps one key thing that uh we could uh, that they want one question that they were left with that um, might be answered by even another panelist. So, if we can just give some thought to it, what was a key thing that stood out for you from the presentations that maybe uh, isn't particularly relevant in your topic or field of expertise that you'd like to add? Uh, and one key question. Um, for, for me, uh, I've been looking at a lot of energy storage systems in Australia and um, and a lot of distributed generation uh, in australia we have a lot of uh, world leading penetration of distributed energy resources and now we're only just figuring out what we need to uh, do with those um, to uh, absorb them and accommodate them as we start this process of electrification of our grid and uh, in doing that um, there are some significant challenges we're seeing in our country that i anticipate Lots of other countries will also have faced those challenges um, as the distribution network, um, which weren't really designed for two-way power flow, starts to uh, reach the levels of hosting capacity they can get with um, uh, distributed PV systems. Uh, and we start to move towards having uh, virtual power plants and seeing some of the uh, devices that underpin our transition to renewable energy in our summer country. So um, for all the, the presentations there, but I think we've seen, I'd be keen to, to see to which degree um, the electrification and distributed generation um, has to play in some of these resources and these projections and modeling. Um, 
I will uh, hand across to the, the next panelist and I'll uh, nominate Carolina to uh, share, this, uh, share this, um, your perspective on the topics we've seen and where you think things might go. Thank you, Warwick. Mm, yeah, uh, I have been hearing all the panelists. First of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity to give my opinion on all of this. Uh, my main thought is that we all need to consider this transition, transition all over. It's not easy to pull out the magic one and say, to point out in a specific topic on the challenges. <clears throat> my main challenge is to how to land this on the floor because it's, it's nice to have objective, it's nice to have 2050 objectives, um, but from our perspective, from the professional sector, let's land this. And the reality is that we are facing many challenges on the go, not only because of COVID, not only because of the Ukrainian war. There are many other, maybe many small, or for some other, all the consideration have on the pay to consider saying we have tax expenses people that are very tag on, on all we have ESG we have distribution infrastructure we have to turn on to more renewable we have to increase to include this this increase of renewable on the sector somehow to adapt um, all that are existing nowadays to this new trend, to this new configuration. And for sure, at least in Spain, and, and I'm sure, I, I know that in other countries also, we have we are being suffering risk curtailment because of capacity. So that's another point that we should reach to be able to adapt. I am pretty sure that is a mindset change and sustainability is in the forefront but we also have to to make these to be able to manage this volatility and also as companies keep our risk very controlled and somehow from my perspective the, in the short term i could I can say my my first challenges would be number one people and uh, we have to access the talent people we have to train the talent people it was historically a very closed market so the professionals that we are here for some period young so we have to now create this this mindset on changing now i want to be part of this change now i want to be part of the sector and what's in there so we have to to give this opportunity to new joiners to adapt to feel like being in the sector to be like part of this this transition and and also for the the ones that we are not that young to to learn and to to be on on the connection with the, the youngest. And it's not that easy. Second will be regulatory certainty. Stability is the name of the game. For the company, the stability is needed for the financing, for the managing people, for managing a company. We need this stability. Now we are feeling this volatility in the market and we need to be able to somehow make this volatility stable in our company so it's another challenge that we are feeling and also for the and i have in spain and portugal i'm head of asset management in iberia for synergic and at least majority of the sites that we are managing are feeding tariff are have a, um, a revenue that comes from the government but what we are facing now is for the new constructions permitting local and municipality decisions are being blocked because of this so many requests and they are not able to solve all the requests that are coming 
So there is a, a block in the permitting that is also not helping us to go as fast as we would like in this in this run to, to achieve the goals. And also, as I commented before, the capacity is needed to land all these initiatives that are needed for the future. But we need to land this considering the grid, considering our capacity now, considering all the stuff that are coming. And we are suffering now. We have grid curtailment because of the, the grid capacity and because of the grid and and all the parameters that are being considered. So mainly these are my my concern in in all of this transition to to this energy transition and that is is in the market. And and as as Warwick gave me before, I give now the floor to Renuka Sharma. Thank you, um, Carolina and Warwick. Um, Jay Sola, thank you for having me today and to all the panelists and the interesting insights that were shared. Warwick, to answer your question on what stood out to me today uh, was uh, Gao shared, Lisa Gao shared about the innovation in material. For me, that's extremely exciting to see with the perovskite solar cells potentially efficiency go up to 32%. Um, that's great for us to hear as developers. Um, also very exciting to hear that prices are normalizing uh, and supply chain is, is getting easier because we did face certain issues last year and, and corporate PPAs are a market that uh, we're quite active in as well. And so that helps us on the development side for corporate PPAs. Um, in terms of what I see as trends that are very positive is there's no doubt there's an increased demand for renewable energy. Um, but with that comes supply chain challenges, especially in terms of supply chain transparency, quality control, and environmental sustainability. Um, and whilst it's very nice when you have these feed-in tariffs in certain countries still, uh, we see that our corporate customers especially ask us a lot of difficult questions, which, which uh, we, have, we have to be very clear and honest with them. So that, that can be challenging as well. Um, and innovation and material as well. I think all this ongoing research, all the fantastic art that has been done in all these companies uh, has the potential to really improve efficiency and durability of the cells. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, so overall, our outlook, especially within Asia Pacific, these are the markets I operate within, um, is very positive and we see lots of the with the issues in the supply chain also lessening, I think we have a good year ahead. But people, definitely, Carolina, we agree, it's increasingly difficult to find good people. I echo that sentiment. Um, and it's, I think, it's going to get worse if you look at the numbers uh, over the next 10 years as well. So retention will be key as well when thinking of how to grow the business within these regions. And I now pass on to um, Bartos. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me as well. Uh, it's uh, been very interesting for me to to observe the, the panel that happened before our, our session. But let me start by saying something else, and something that, that touches upon what Caroline and what the, uh, what uh, Renuka was uh, was telling about uh, talent. I'm really happy to be part of a panel in which 50% of the invited panelists are women. I think this is uh, uh, not that common, especially in the conventional energy space. It's more frequent in renewable energy and should be the way it's supposed to be. So this is something to be recognized. Unfortunately, that's not the case in the country where my company operates, uh, Poland, where we frequently have expert panels that consist of seven males and one female, and this female is a moderator, for example. Um, I wish that was uh, more akin to what we have today. Uh, so that's one thing. Second thing is uh, I'm very happy that this more and more spotlight. Clearly, it's been uh, on the on the on the rise over the last couple of years. Uh, last year, residential and the CNI installations delivered 50 gigawatts of uh, new power online globally. Uh, this is uh, finally a uh, kind of segment that merits uh, you know high level attention that is getting at the moment. Uh, previously, it was mostly about utility scale solar. I have had the privilege of uh, 
benefiting, so to speak, from this from this increasing trend. I was a, a, a management board member at, a, at an EPC focusing on residential and CNI installations. Now I'm heading Menlo Electric, uh, which is a distributor, and both companies have been have had the chance to grow very fast. So it gives me maybe a little bit of a more frontline experience, so to speak. Uh, I'll be more maybe talking about the issues that I've been experiencing myself, uh, being a, an EPC provider and being a distributor. And I think uh, some some issues are not being brought up as 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 as, uh, as frequently as they should. And one of them is that the reason behind this surge in residential and CNA installations is clearly economical. It's not that people have finally reached a conclusion, uh, switched to green energy, and they've become more eco aware and so on and so on. It's just it's about just being able, being able to say on electricity bills and in some countries like South Africa it's just about providing continuity of electricity supply that cannot be guaranteed by the by the power from the grid so it's about very pragmatic reasons and because of this it's on the one hand it should be more sustainable uh, because it's not reliant on some government incentives or some public campaigns it's, it's very uh, very clear internal incentive on the part of residential and uh, and, and corporate uh, clients but on the other hand it, there is a there is a there is a threat uh, to it. And one thing that many people uh, don't realize and that we should do something about, I think, as an industry is that the vast majority of big residential and CNI installers are in the red. They're not making profits. Uh, if you look at the um, uh, at, uh, National uh, Renewable uh, Energy Laboratory uh, in the States, the government owned agency that every year publishes an aggregate of financial results across the value chain in, in solar systems. It, the small manufacturers, they make money. Cell manufacturers, they make money. Model manufacturers, they make money. Inverter manufacturers, the same. Developers, the same. Integrators are heavily in the red. Typically, they make margins below minus 10% uh, operating margin. Now, I come from Poland. Poland has gone through a huge boost in the residential and CNI installations. Um, and the last year delivered 400,000 household and small CNI systems across the country of 36 million people. So it, it, that, that definitely increased the penetration. It's actually on par of what Australia is experiencing at the moment. Of the six biggest installers in the country, four finished the year in the red, and two finished with minor profits, the biggest of which had 1% EBIT margin. Now, why should we care? We should care because that means that there is no um, while we're operating in a business of sustainability, the business in this space are not becoming sustainable. They're not getting the capital, they're not getting the cash, and they're not getting the long-term to be able to serve the increased level of and uh, this is that are going to be the, the, the clients years to come or among bigger installers coming out of the industry is another operate in an industry provide sustainable solution durable 25 30 years um, uh, to come and there's a number of first off if, uh, if if companies start focusing more on the experience that the installer is bringing to the table rather than just the price that's a, that's one way to go but i'm very skeptical this is going to be very effective just because historically um businesses have only turned to solar when that became economically um, uh, attractive to them. So I don't think they're going to overnight switch their natural modus operandi to focus more on quality and the prices. So there's part on the regulatory side, I think, uh, where there should be some kind of a, maybe certification or other way for the government to create or for the agency or for the regulators to create certain modes that would promote, that would first of secure margins for the bigger installers and more importantly, give them uh, more stability and uh, allow them to grow uh, and allow them to convince more and more businesses and residential users to use their services and to be able to serve them uh, even after the installation is finished for many years to come to assure that this installation is, you know, is durable and, and can be used for, for 20, 25 years. So I think this is something that's been frequently overlooked. I'm quite surprised that many people in the industry don't know that residential installers and small CNI installers are quite frequently not making money on their businesses that are very frequently squeezed out of the margin by the by their clients but i think this is an overlooked issue that at some point is going to have to come to the spotlight 
So I'll, I'll be very happy to, if, if someone can comment on this, I'm very happy to have a discussion on this later. Late. At the moment, let me just pass on to, and if you can help me with this. Alfonso. Uh, shall we hear from uh, Mariano next? Okay, thank you. So I'm not Enrique Selva, as you can imagine. Uh, he couldn't make it for, for joining us. Uh, I'm uh, Mariano Soria, I'm the Chief Innovation Officer of uh, Umbrella Group uh, that, is, uh, that belongs to IM2. Um, and, um, and I have to say thank you to JA for the company. Um, I have to say that um, I, I, you've been talking about distributed generation, uh, Warwick and Bartos. Uh, I have to say that in Spain, in Spain, we are not in, like in Australia, and, and uh, so we are more secure, have a, a very strong grid, um, and, and we are not so focused. But it's true that uh, that is going to come, and uh, the more we introduce renewable energy to the to the grid, uh, the more uh, that we have to, to talk about uh, um, stability and, and to change uh, what we have to be sure that the, that the grid is, is going to fit. Um, and, uh, and uh, I would like to say that uh, the, that Carolina has introduced um, a lot of issues that are very important. She has mentioned a lot of stability. I think that's uh, the key the key thing that I would like to, to introduce to this uh, to this uh, panel. Um, I think th there are many issues uh, like uh, uh, labor labor cost or or retain talent or or prices or supply chain or financial options, all, all these issues uh, influence the current situation uh, of companies like IM2. Um, some of them in two directions, such as the, the war in Ukraine. On the one hand, the war has highlighted the need for each country to manage its own energy, but at the same time, it is putting the supply chain at, at risk. Uh, of course, the, the, the increase in taxes, in inflation, financial costs, have an impact on the on the final cost of the projects, and in the increase in the energy prices. Uh, but it's true that that the renewable energy market is is very strong. Uh, it's very difficult to stop it. The renewable energy, solar energy, where we are is is going to be, I think, in any scenario, uh, the cheapest energy in the market. And 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 furthermore, the world govern governments will favor its growth for environmental and political interests. So, so what's for me, what, mo what most impacts the sector, but especially companies uh, and specific projects is uh, short-term instability. A sudden change in prices uh, in the supply chain or in regulatory changes in a specific region or in the calculation of risks in, in, the, in the financial sector, puts many projects uh, with uh, contracts already signed at, at risk, especially um, uh, in the EPC project, more, more than the, in, in the IPP business. But uh, this is, I think, the, the, the key factors that, that, that is more um, affecting us uh, as the companies, uh, the, the instability, um it is the, the the worst thing because the, the the evolution of the market is very difficult to predict many forecasts have failed in the past uh, i don't believe prices will have a clear trend in 2023 we will have ups and downs depending on different uh, new technologies as we have just uh, listened uh, before maybe launching in 2023 too but i don't think they will have a major impact on the sector in the short term uh, maybe the regulatory changes are more powerful. Uh, so regions, um, governments can help a lot in launching technologies or in increasing consumption locally uh, uh, with giving subsidies. Uh, I think I think like I think Carolina said also adaptation is what the companies are usually uh, doing any any time and and is what we have to do. And if there is stability we can uh, move forward easily than if everything changes suddenly 
and I don't know if um, just to uh, invite uh, maybe Alonso Martina to be the next one. Yeah. <laughs> Pat, ah, thank pardon. you, Mariano. <laughs> no, worries, no worries at all. And my name is, and I'm senior at uh, Foresight Group. First of all, thank you very much to speak on this. And I would like to focus on PPA. Uh, from 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 Italy. Spain is leading. PPA market. This is something that I'm happy to think there is uh, a lot to do uh, as uh, that will invest the project possibility your PPAs with wind city uh, or visibility on the thermal energy project. I think in general that operate in each area. Climate risk in business model in order to be a problem before for all business, uh, business both in terms of profitability in terms of uh, to the environment. One of the key in which companies progress towards the is to long term PPA by which they both uh, secure and uh, stable, I would say, low energy price for the coming years and also help and contribute to the decarbonization of the economy uh, in general. Uh, as uh, we have been active in the uh, European market for some years now, we have signed many PPAs in the past. But I still have the feeling, or at least before the energy crisis that we are suffering at the moment, I have the feeling that and some companies were still reluctant to enter into long-term PPAs because they were, uh, let's say, committing to pay uh, a, a price for the energy for an amount of years. But given current volatility that we have seen in the market, I think that 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 was a mistake and many companies now wish that they had entered a PPA. For example, in Spain in 2020, 2021, where prices were between 30 and 40 euros per megawatt hour. And so I hope that uh, current energy prices that we have in Europe due to the high gas uh, prices help us uh, all to see the benefit of this kind of instrument, both for the energy producer on our side, because it helps making projects viable and also financially viable. And also from the from the other side, from the side of the company, in, by which uh, they can secure a, a stable price in the, in the future, not only for climate and environmental concern, but also they can secure a fixed price and focus on the on their business that probably is not acquiring acquiring energy. So yeah, I, I think, I, again, I'm happy to see that in Spain, we are leading this market, but it's still a lot to, a lot to do. Also, a uh, challenge that I think we face here is how we allow uh, for a smaller company that cannot provide the amount of guarantees that this kind of uh, agreement require to enter into long-term PPA, how we can give them access to this kind of agreement. Um, one of the main, one potential alternative would be uh, some regulatory and public support that allow them to provide these guarantees. But this is a, an open and ongoing discussion and I hope to, to see more progress and I'm sure we will see it in the, in the coming years. And now I let, I don't know if there is any more speaker or I was the, the last one. Thank you, Alfonso. Um, we've had some discussion broadly and it has been along the lines of uh, focus on the economics of uh, PV and technologies. And we've heard that some companies are profitable um, in many different uh, countries. We've heard about the economics of, of PPAs, um, heard of some technical uh, advancements in, in panels and also the challenges 
that are going to come not with just not only with financing this growth but also with uh, with people in it and so uh, there are some challenges certainly in the financial um, area one of the topics that was requested uh, for us to talk about was also how companies are navigating 100 percent renewable energy requirements and so um, if you've uh, got something uh, lined up in your thoughts, then please uh, feel free to share them in a moment. From the Australian perspective, um, and, and yes, noting that Australia does have a very weak uh, grid, we've got a long, thin grid, and um, that's made it difficult for a lot of solar farms, even when they've got PPAs from companies who are trying to get 200% renewables, um, getting that power into the grid has been problematic, both connecting it while maintaining um, uh, ensuring the grid remains stable, uh, but then also even if the connection is provided, often there's so much congestion um, at the same time that the, um, the, the line gets quite lossy. So um, from the perspective of companies going out and signing power purchase agreements so they can get to 100% renewables, there's certainly been a, um, a steady increase, uh, a rapid increase in that. Uh, particularly post the um, Glasgow COP, um, as our corporates uh, and multinationals take that uh, seriously that they need to be um, you know, buying their own renewable energy. The challenge, the, the second challenge is that the match between um, buyers and sellers. And so um, it's often that an individual entity won't necessarily have be big enough to take all the output of um, a solar farm or a wind farm, for example. And, uh, and but there are challenges in finding and forming conglomerates. Um, there has been um, corporate buyers groups, but they it still remains quite a challenge here. So, um, Carolina, uh, from your perspective, um, is there something that uh, you'd like to contribute on how companies are can navigating 100% renewable energy requirements in your area of expertise? Thank you, Warwick. I think I, I did the approach considering <clears throat> the challenges to navigate to this 100% renewable requirements. My concern now will be about technologies and new technologies coming in and, and innovations. I am always checking on the operations perspective. Uh, I should be more innovative, but I'm not. I am the one leading with 365 PV sites, old PV sites in Spain and Portugal. So I am more aware about um, response time. I am more aware about guarantees. I am the knowledge that we already have in the sector during the past 16 years or 17 years and try to apply our knowledge as what they were saying to the new things that are coming and try to match the needs that we have now because the, the PV sites that we have built in 2008, they are still a, a long way to go. It's still 15 years that they have to be operating. So, and now the importance is how I can match the old technologies that I already have in place with the new technologies that are mainly not compatible at all in this 100%. Now I have new inverters that I have to do modifications on, on the site level to adapt to the new requirements. Now I have new types, new dimensions, new... Everything is new and it's positively new because I think we are applying this knowledge. But now we have a problem with the old sites that we have to also think about this new building now. What's in the future? What is next steps for them? Uh, what about in 15 years, 20 years? What are my solutions for that PV site? So the, what we are struggling now, at least from my perspective, always a positive one, is to deal with this um, matching new technology with the old ones that are there and are going to, to be there if we are lucky another 15 years. And, and this is somehow how we are struggling with the new technologies nowadays 
with in order to make a higher stock, maybe to have a centralized stock for all our sites, to make our, our numbers and in order to be competitive in the future, because it's, uh, let's remember that we are companies and we need to have this model and we need to have these changes and we need to somehow to be stable on our business case. So this is somehow what we are facing on the operative side from the, from the owner's perspective. I don't know how is it being seen from the providers or operators perspective. I don't know, Renuka, if you have another view on this. Yeah, and, and I'm just going to take a step back to address Alfonso's question first on corporate PPAs, because that's also a market that we see as very exciting and growing very quickly. In Asia Pacific, um, Australia is far advanced. They've had it for a couple of years now, but um, Korea, Japan, Malaysia, they've just announced new um, regimes where they allow now for direct corporate PPAs, which is very exciting. Um, but the problem is always you're banking on that company not going insolvent. And for us, we still view it very positively because you have your Amazons, your Googles, your Facebook, they all have very large data centers in the areas that we operate. Um, so with them, there's going to be continued supply. We also have a lot of supply chain factories in Vietnam that produce for Nike, Adidas. And what we're seeing is they're forcing the entire supply chain to also become more sustainable. So a factory in Vietnam or Thailand that is producing jeans for a hundred different global brands now has that added pressure from corporates to put a rooftop installation within that. That's really helping right, and corporates and the government to act. So um, that development. If I could also just quick to your question, installers, because we see this being a problem for a lot that we deal with. We have a distribution business. What we're also seeing, large distributors are now acquiring the potentially as well, bringing so they can provide service. Of that's happening in Poland, that trend, but that's probably is also heading. It makes for them to do so. That's always a little bit of a tricky question whether you want to do this because then you're going to be competing with some of your clients as a distributor. We actually went the other way around. We set up a distribution business as a subsidiary of our uh, installation business. And we had the same issue, right? There were installers who would not buy from us because we were a subsidiary of another installer. So it's a, it's a tricky balance to, to, to make. I think, look, I mean, I think companies have shown over the last 24 to 36 months that they respond great to economic stimulus. To, to, to economic incentives. A payback period for CNI installations shortened uh, according to Ristat Energy in some European markets to below 12 months. The, the surge in number of, of companies interested in, in getting solar uh, was, was amazing. Uh, and it's just, it's just, I think it's as simple as that. If we can create the right incentives for the companies, they will respond accordingly. And the, the thing is that we here collectively represent companies who are beneficiaries of the growth of renewables. But there is a, a huge group of businesses in conventional energy space who have held historically a very strong political sway uh, and they can lobby for solutions that are um, uh, or against actually the solutions that will be harmful to them that are kind of stopping us from really uh, capturing the full potential. And let me be very specific there. There is a number of companies who would love to go solar However, they do not have um, the roofs will, would not sustain installation that would cover their needs. So ideally for them, they would buy a plot of land, not, not far from their uh, uh, manufacturing site, for example, and they would use a direct line to get this energy to their site. Now there's a number of European countries that do not have regulations that would permit that. And why is that? It's just because electricity distribution companies would then lose a sizable chunk of the market and then they wouldn't have the funds to maintain or develop networks uh, according to the needs that the, that the network represents. Yeah? So there is a, a, a very influential group of businesses quite frequently owned by the state or, or by state uh, uh, controlled agencies who are against introducing this regulation to overcome this. If we can provide them with a cushion 
that would still allow them to operate without uh, this getting in their way, they would probably uh, not no longer block this. And then having direct line regulations in many countries would be a game changer for hundreds and hundreds of companies to go solar. Because otherwise, if you cannot do direct line, your only alternative may be to go for solar and storage, and that inflates the cost dramatically. And many companies will not afford this, or their business case will not no longer be attractive. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Lida from J Solar. I would also like to share some of my thoughts. Uh, about the two topics. The first topic is how companies are navigating 100% renewable energy. So from my perspective to achieve the 100% renewable energy requirement, I think green power application and the reduction of fossil, fuel, uh, fossil energy consumption are the main ways. Uh, actually, J Solar has been promoting the construction of distributed PV power stations at our manufacturing basis so that we can produce and use more green electricity. Um, our each production base uses its own rooftop, carport, open space to install various forms of PV power plants, such as small scale ground mounted power plants, rooftop stations and floating PV system. So by this means, our company not only reduces its dependence on traditional electricity, but also supplies clean energy for the office, as well as the production, thereby reducing the carbon emission. And besides, in the, pro, in the process of building new factory, Day Solar gives priority with good energy structure, such as Qijing in Yunnan province. The percentage of green power is over 90%. In addition, J Solar works together with upstream and downstream to reduce carbon emissions. For upstream, our, our, uh, our supplier evaluation criteria now include whether the suppliers use green electricity and whether uh, carbon disclo disclosure is available. And for downstream, J Solar works with major power companies to push governments to increase the proportion of renewable energy generation. And in terms of products, I think high efficiency N-type PV module will be an important support to achieve carbon neutrality target. Uh, and um, the next topic is the economics of the solar system and the innovations in PV technologies. About this topic, um, as a PV module manufacturer, I think there are three ways to further reduce LCOE to optimize the economics of the solar system. Um, so three ways are reducing uh, module production costs, improving power generation performance, and improving module reliability. So first, regarding the cost, okay, we can further reduce the production cost of PV, module, uh, of PV modules per watt. By, re by reducing material consumption and improving module efficiency through process optimization. Um, in addition, we hope that the industry can standardize module size in the future because standardized products will simplify the installation pro uh, process and reduce the need for custom uh, customized components for installation. This would reduce system costs, installation time, and labor costs, and help to reduce the overall LCOE. And the, uh, and the second point, as mentioned, uh, is improving power generation performance. Uh, we can improve the actual power generation by enhancing the performance of modules, such as better low-light performance, better temperature coefficient. And according to our data from demonstration project, Power yield of our debris 4.0x module is 3.9% higher than that of PTA module. And the simulation results show that by using N type module, the BOS cost can be reduced by 2.1%. LCOE can be reduced by about 4.6%. And the third point is improving module reliability. It requires modules with reliable and stable electrical performance, for example, lower power degradation. Also, it requires excellent mechanical performance, in, such as 
mechanical load performance and hail, hail resistance. And we are continuously optimizing the process and design of, of our product to achieve better motor reliability so that we can ensure that the PV system operates efficiently and effectively over its whole lifetime. Um, that's all from my side, thanks. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank you very you much, very um, much Lida, Lida, and, and, and thanks, thanks a lot to all of the um, live panelists. A very lively discussion. Um, we've got one more um, contribution from uh, Denisa Fainis, who unfortunately could not join live. Um, Denisa is uh, Secretary General of the Middle East Solar Industry Association, and we will, um, with your share now, a pre-recorded um, video. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Denisa Finas. I am the Secretary General of the Middle East Solar Industry Association, uh, MESIA. We are the only nonprofit solar association, and we bring together um, the entire solar sector across the Middle East and North Africa. Um, our scope is to promote the solar sector and create opportunities in the region. Um, we collaborate as a marketing partner uh, and content partner with uh, several um, organizations in the local sphere, regional and international uh, space. We organize educational webinars, events, uh, networking workshops. Uh, we also produce uh, market trend uh, reports. We have over 80 uh, local, regional, and international members um, that are key partners of the value chain. There are EPCs, developers, investors, contractors, technical advisors, etc. So we're happy to be here today representing all of them. It is important to identify that although they do have the climatic resources, not all countries in the Middle East um, and North Africa region have the infrastructure to build solar plants, um, to reap the yields, but also the infrastructure to export energy. Um, and that we know that Europe is dealing with major challenges in the um, supply of um, gas um, and certain restrictions of uh, in the distribution space. Um, similarly to Europe, using, using radiators to keep everyone warm, the Middle East has a huge need for air conditioning, um, but also for water desalination plants, sewage treatment and other industries. So there's huge potential in this region. Uh, the temperatures have been rising everywhere. So you see electricity demands also peak but um, also the cost of fossil fuel has peaked. So it makes sense to integrate solar air power into the existing grid. It's cost competitive, it's quick to install, can be deployed to large communities. Um, I do want to shed light on Saudi Arabia doing a great job uh, issuing new regulations this past October. Um, they have a capacity to produce over 90 gigawatts and to supply through the whole Gulf region. Um, I'm going to put more emphasis on the politically stable countries, um, the implementation of solar power is easier there. Um, there is an existing infrastructure in place. Um, Jordan has been a pioneer in uh, solar energy. Uh, they're currently one of the leaders in the Middle East and North Africa. More than 25% of their energy is currently sourced from solar and wind. Um, they have a target of about 31% by 2030. Saudi Arabia also has a target to supply um, 50% of their energy needs uh, with renewable energy by 2030. Um, you can get more highlights from the Solar Outlook report that we put out in January during the World Future Energy Summit. We have had contributors from all countries in the Middle East and North Africa um, shed light on what is happening in their countries. Um, we do see a huge emphasis in, in, emphasis, uh, in this region. We expect a lot of um, investments in the renewable energy space. Um, solar alone can contribute to about 26 gigawatts of renewable energy in the, both the utility scale and the solar uh, distributed solar PV. Um, the Gulf has recorded some of the lowest solar tariffs in the recent years. Um, the prices have dropped close to one cent per kilowatt hour. Um, we do have to keep in mind that the Gulf region in particular has favorable solar conditions. Uh, there's an availability of cheap and sunny land, low labor costs, 
uh, low interest in financing, uh, but also supportive tax uh, regimens and the decrease in the components prices. So um, I would definitely keep an eye on the UAE, on Saudi Arabia, on Oman as well, both solar, wind, and green hydrogen. Uh, Kuwait are also uh, is also mention, uh, notable to mention as an active player. Um, Adding solar, solar energy storage into the mix can do can help the region uh, realize their green goals, and I do believe that uh, the MENA is home to about 15% of the world's installed energy storage capacity. Um, although the cost the de cost has been declining to deploy this type of solution, there is a um, need for. Um, green policies and a favorable environment for the deployment of um, storage, but also um, warehousing and how to how to keep it um, stored properly. Um, so yeah, I think we see uh, an acceleration in the countries that have significantly power supply shortages and that uh, make the ESS implementation imperative and a necessity. Um, those are Lebanon and Iraq. Um, and the uh, MENA ESS deployment is about 1.5 gigawatts at the moment compared to 10 gigawatts globally. And again, we're talking about creating the regulations around ESS. Um, there are regulations on solar power, but nothing on energy storage. So it increases the uh, investor's risk aversion. Um, so yeah, I think uh, these are our updates. Uh, we're excited to see COP28 happening um, at the end of this year in Abu Dhabi. We invite everyone uh, to come visit us and uh, please stay updated uh, on our LinkedIn page, on our uh, website. We will also issue a mid-year report, solar outbreak report from Messia. So um, yeah, thank you everyone.